Welcome everyone. Glad you can join us here. Mm, beautiful. We're having a blast seeing all you on the big screen and and uh, wow, just another great great week and oh they're dancing at La Casa. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we feel the vibe for this week when we prayed on the movie. Uh, we were looking at some really amazing themes about fear of full transparency. And what was our second one? Belief in wrongness. Belief in wrongness. Oh, wow, those two combined, along with I think the authority problem or yeah. autonomy. Yeah. Autonomy in there. But those top two, fear of full transparency and what belief, belief, in, wrongness. belief in wrongness. Okay. I can't even remember that one. See, I couldn't remember it for five seconds. <laughs> but, but we will. We were praying on a movie that, that would uh, really light us up with those because those are core things in undoing the self-concept. And we've had some pretty intense movies. We've had a string of really intense movies. So the feeling going into this week, we were also putting into our prayer, we need some humor. We need some comedy, uh, comedy relief uh, in this undoing, you know, in this dismantling of the ego. So we're going to call on our one of our... Uh, Great actor uh, contributors to the to the healing of the mind, Jim Carrey. So that's right. We have a Jim Jim Carrey movie tonight. It's called Liar Liar, and we're going to watch Liar Liar because there's a big dismantling that goes on in the context of the film uh, between uh, Fletcher who that's the character that Jim Carrey is going to play in, in this movie, uh, a lawyer, Jim Carrey playing a lawyer, and his wife Aubrey and their son Max. So we're going to use the family self-concept as part of undoing the belief in the self-concept of time and space, which is the larger context. But we love to see the undoing of the self-concept in all kind of different angles. And uh, if it can be done with some humor, then that's even all the better. Because we really want to be able to, to have a lighthearted approach to this dismantling and this undoing. So in the movie, Fletcher plays a lawyer, and, and very much like happens in, in a lot of families where if you have somebody that's like the, the sole provider, they can get all wrapped up in the career aspect of this world in terms of making money and trying to get ahead and advance their career and make more money with the belief that more money will be able bring in be able to buy more things, more stuff, go on more adventures and so on and so forth. Even though Jesus is telling us in the course in the Beyond Our Idol section, what is an idol? Do you think you know an idol is for more of something? It does not matter more of what. So Jesus is equating idol, not with a golden totem pole uh, over in Babylonia or something. He's, he's saying an idol is for more of something. It does not matter what. So in this movie, of Jim Carrey is motivated by the career motive to uh, advance his uh, his law career, and in you know people can even rationalize that if for the benefit of the family, and yet uh, he seems to fall into a pattern of deception of lying, and uh, it becomes so habitual that he basically takes it on as a strategy. Uh, for navigating through the world of time and space, and he's he's lying around every corner, and he's doing it all with the justification that lying is 
advancing him. Lying is helping him become more successful. But as we know from spiritual development and spiritual teachings, it's not the advancement and success as the world measures success that helps you advance spiritually. It's actually uh, reversed. It's like when you think you're advancing in terms of egoic or societal terms, Jesus says you cannot judge your advances from your retreats and really what we perceive as advances in the self-concept are actually retreats into darkness in our mind, retreats away from the light. And then when we go through these humble undoings and these humble dismantlings in the self-concept, we're actually advancing toward the light in our mind. And we're actually coming closer to the light of truth of, of who we really are. But it's very disorienting when you've been raised with a whole self-concept of bigger, better, faster, more, achieve, accomplish, accumulate, possess, own, you know, all those things that are tied into uh, what the ego would say is improving your self-concept, um, making yourself a better self, a more valuable self in the world's eyes, and actually that's just a, a retreat into darkness. Now, if we transfer that to our experiences with spirituality, with The Course in Miracles, you could say that that everyone who seems to come to time and space and who believes they're a person in the world and living this linear lifetime out between birth and death, uh, the currency, you know, we talk a lot about different currencies in countries, you know, the currency in Mexico is the pesos, the currency in the United States, US dollars, currency in much of Europe is the euro. Time is the currency of the ego. The ego has one currency and that is time. And everything that it does is bent on reinforcing a, a self-concept that is tied into that currency of time. In fact, you will even hear cliches, time is money. Well, in one sense that's a, that's a pretty good uh, metaphor there because it's a synonym because money is also a, a made-up um, concept that the ego came up with and it, it oftentimes gets equated with uh, self-worth and so does time. You know, people would say, well, I like to have more free time and then when you ask them what's free time, it's like time when I'm not working for someone else or time that I can spend on my own. It's like I want to spend the currency in a way that doesn't have the restraints and restrictions, but still we have to learn that, that we have to give time and money and everything else over to the Holy Spirit to use just as symbols to help us unwind from this ego self-concept. So in this movie we're going to see uh, basically Max, the, the, their child, uh, Audrey and Fletcher's child. Max has a wish because he sees his father as never keeping his word, he's not of integrity, and he just wishes that for one day he, his father could not tell a lie. And so uh, that's going to be the thing. It's almost like when you pray to the Holy Spirit and you say, okay Holy Spirit, I'm coming back, I want to know the happy dream, I don't want to know the real world, I want to come back to the forgiven world. And Holy Spirit saying, yeah, oh, that's good, well just tell no lie. What does that mean, tell no lie? It means be authentic, it means be intuitive, it means be guided. It means let your yes be yes and no be no. You, every single moment you have an intuitive self that knows the way. Isn't that spectacular that we have this intuition, this higher power, this higher self that's within, within us, the Holy Spirit, and all we have to really learn is to let our yes be yes and our no be no. We have to be able to have straight talk. We have to be able to look at our friends, our families, employers, neighbors, everyone that we perceive in 
in the dream world, we have to just be actually very authentic. And what that means is we have to let the Spirit speak through us. And we have to learn to let the Spirit laugh through us and smile through us and hug through us. We have to learn how to make intuitive choices that are given. When we try to choose with the ego, we're trying to choose all on our own. And when we choose with the Spirit, we're in the Spirit of uh, Holy Spirit, decide for God, for me. If I make no decision by myself, we heard in the rules for decision, this is the day that will be given me. Whatever it is, a happy day, a joyful day, a flowing day, a peaceful day. We need to resign now as our own teacher. We need to step aside. We need to uh, try to get out of the driver's seat and get in the passenger role which does not mean that we're passive, it just means that we're going to be tuned in to the Spirit with every single decision we make. And, and then Jesus says, you're going to feel so great when you just let yourself be intuitively guided. He even goes so far as to say, when you have learned to decide with God, all decisions become as easy and as right as breathing. Imagine your decision making during the day being as easy and right as breathing. I'm assuming none of you have emphysema or <laughs> something like that. I, I'm, I'm assuming we're all uh, healthy <laughs> seemingly adults, so it's a nice metaphor. And it will be as if you're carried down a quiet path in summer. Wow, that is a nice way to think about guidance. If I had, had, had thought the first time I was inquiring about guidance, because everyone has a little trepidation about what's the, what's the Spirit going to have me do? Oh my God, I won't have control over my life. Somebody else will be directing my life. Ah, carried down a quiet path in summer. That's the way we like to hear it. That's the way, uh -huh, uh -huh, I like it. Uh -huh. Carried down a quiet path in summer. Next time the ego says, be careful, be careful about this guidance thing, just, just tell the ego, carry down a quiet path in summer. <laughs> that's, that's smooth and easy, you know, that's gentle, that's flowing, you know, that's, that's what it's about. So, and also, if I can pull back a little bit in the context of this movie, okay, you, you've got Fletcher and, and Audrey and their son Max, but how do relationships work? You know, oh, everyone's saying, how do relationships work? It's such a mystery, they say. It's such a mystery. Why is there so much conflict? Why is there so much fighting, arguing, so many control issues in relationships? Why? Is there so much struggle? Can't I have an easy relationship? Holy Spirit, they say, are you listening? Jesus, Jesus, easy, easy, do, easy does it, please. Easy relationship. And Jesus is saying, yeah, it's just a back to the guidance. Be intuitive. Relax in your mind, be intuitive, and you will see that there's a divine ease that will come into all your relationships. Because... Your relationships will be based on guidance. What does that mean? Your relationships will be vibrational. Vibrational? Your relationships will involve frequency. Frequency? Is that frequency of contact? No. It's a, it's a vibrational frequency where you relax into this harmonious state of mind and you come closer and closer to the spirit and you go higher and higher in the vibrations and then the world you see, you perceive witnesses to that vibration. So you draw things to you. We were looking, uh, I saw Brian and Alexandra joining in with us tonight too and uh, Brian was on when he turned his camera on and I said, oh yeah, I saw them about 20 I, we were in the same uh, spiritual community about 21, 22 years ago. He looks, he looks like 20, he looks younger than when I met him. <laughs> he's younger than when I met him. He's, he's taken 25 years off, off of his appearance. 
and he's laughing. See, this is what I mean. When you follow the Spirit, you get into these vibrational harmonies and then you draw forth witnesses. And then of course you get happier and happier and lighter and lighter because you're lining up with the vibrations. You're lining up with the calling of your heart and you're just drawing forth witnesses all around you. And that's how it works. I mean, if, if you get partnered up, a lot of times people get partnered up and of course it's based on past preferences and it's, it's karmic and it's, it's all based on, on unresolved issues of still trying to play something out in time as if, you know, as if you're, you just keep meeting some images that you still have, are holding on to in your seemingly personal past and then you just see these reflections of those thoughts. But as you start to move deeper and deeper into this, of course the Holy Spirit and Jesus will use everything. It, it uses things like att attraction. There are certain people that you're more attracted to. Is that based on preferences? Of course it is. You know, Christ is not more attracted to one than another, but, but as you're waking up, the, the Spirit will use the ego preferences and will draw you towards certain people. And, and it was all for the purpose of undoing, of loosening from the belief in the past, which is loosening from the belief in guilt. And then, as you go deeper and deeper towards this sense of, of complete alignment, then the Spirit will just bring to you the witnesses of your state of mind. And then you start to generalize that and transfer the training so that you go through your day and you do feel this kind of sense of, of harmony, of vibrational harmony, where your mind is just drawing forth witnesses to its own sense of, of harmony. Now in this movie, uh, Liar, Liar, you know, uh, when, when you start using lying as a, as a daily defense mechanism, it's, it's not uh, surprising that you have a career in the legal profession <laughs> because law is kind of known for its attack and defense as part of, built in as part of the career. But, but I think it's more than that. It's also this idea of advancement, of trying to be something more. And anytime you get into a career with this idea that you put your advancement of your personality self, advancement of your self-concept as a priority, then that, that has to be replaced as a priority with forgiveness. So that's what the prayer of the heart is. The prayer of the heart is, Holy Spirit, show me forgiveness as my priority. Let me put that at the top and then let me give you the rest of what I believe I am and use everything. Use what, I perceive, use what I perceive myself to be, where I perceive myself to be. Use the seeming skills, the seeming abilities, the preferences, the likes, the dislikes. Take the whole package. The personality is like an ego preference package and basically all you're doing is say, no, I'm not going to put um, separation and autonomy as my top priority, let's just slip forgiveness into the top position and then let's just say, take the rest, take all of me. That was a, that was a movie, wasn't it, with Lily Tomlin and uh, Steve Martin? All of me, why not take all of me? Can't you see, I'm nothing without you. Just sing that song, you know, to the Holy Spirit. You know, take my heart. You know, it's the whole song is beautiful. If you see it as a prayer to the Holy Spirit, I'm just going to take all of me, all of the, the me that the ego made up. Take all of me and use me, like the Bill Withers song. You just keep on using me until you use me up. You know, you just keep going in that, that flow of you just keep on using me until you use me up, until you use the personality self up, until there's no more need of a personality where I can just see that I'm one with everything and always have been. So I think you're going to enjoy this movie. Uh, 
the, I loved even watch the outtakes from this movie. This this is so hilarious that even when they are making the movie and they show the outtakes after, I just tell you, I just laugh so hard at the outtakes because they are having so much fun in their purpose and their function of of make. Imagine making a movie called Liar Liar and having just this glorious experience of 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 being used and I, I think it's uh, oh, there's an actress in this that plays the other lawyer that's opposite of, of uh, Jim Carrey and uh, I think her name is Lucy Kurtz or something she just had so much fun playing that they would get in the middle of these heated scenes and she would just let rip with some of these uh, funny self-concept jokes during the filming of it, just as a prank, and then they would all just burst into laughter. So even in the making of this movie, they were having a fun time of undoing the self-concept, much less the edited final movie that we'll, we'll see. So just sit back and enjoy and have some good laughs, and I will join in the middle of the movie at some choice scenes, but uh, we're finally getting a nice light-hearted movie. It's still a pretty sharp undoing the self-concept, but I think you're going to really enjoy the laughter as we all go through this together. So thank you. Okay. Well, I've been talking about no private thoughts and no people-pleasing, and still to this day, I get people to write to me and say, could you give me an example of no private thoughts and no people pleasing? As if it's a gray area. And yet, in these last five minutes, ten minutes of the movie, we are seeing a primo example of his, his stream of private thoughts and, and what does the, the discernment, the judgment of the world, it tells you which thoughts you can speak and which thoughts you need to keep for yourself. Well, the ego likes to discriminate between these thoughts and so he's so used to justifying how he feels, how things are going, when people ask him straight on direct questions, oh, I, I was late, uh, the, the car broke down, his bad neighborhood, he just can lay out a litany uh, of, of streams of thoughts which are all just justifications. There's nothing direct coming from his mouth. And then, as part of his profession, he's taken on lying for profit and for gain for, uh, for his career. And yet, we're just ready to come before a judge in this trial. And what, during a trial, what is it that they, they say when they swear you in for a trial? Anybody remember that? Hand up, hand on a Bible. Hand on a Bible. Do you promise to tell the truth? The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. So help you God. So help you God. You see, even in the basic institute of, of, of a court of law, there we have it. That's directly from the Holy Spirit. Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. There it is, just in the beginning of a, of a trial. It's, it's the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's what the guidance is. But when you begin compromising and you begin letting the ego speak your words, letting the ego think your thoughts, you know, give you thoughts that are all based on the self-concept, then the ego is going to, to use those words, no matter what the situation is, for its own purposes. When he's there with the boss, uh, at the, he goes through the whole thing with with his client. Uh, he is has lies spoken through him, lies, more lies, more lies. Why? To get the client, to get the wealthy client, to bring in the 
big money to the firm, so he gets the promotion to be the partner. You see, the ego has improvement, personality self-improvement as its goal, and therefore everything that comes from that purpose is going to come out of his mouth. When, when the boss has had sex with him, wow, that was fantastic, how was it for you? He comes, he's now under the, we'll say the blessing of his son's wish that for one day he cannot tell a lie. He says, I've had better. And then he spends the next minute and a half thinking, what did I say? Because it so contradicts the purpose that he's so used to. So if we start to uh, extend this and we start to transfer the training, we could say that if we bring it back to our own lives, that's what the whole point of being intuitive about. That's the whole point of if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that will be given me. That's why the prayer of A Course in Miracles is, Holy Spirit decide for God, for me, because everything the Holy Spirit will extend through you, when you give your mind over to the Holy Spirit, will be for undoing the self-concept, will be for accepting the atonement, it will be for dismantling the false self. And every single thing that will come from you, will, you will be teaching what you would learn, that you are spirit, that you are one with God. And it will come through though in the most appropriate and practical ways, in your daily interactions. Sometimes people think, you know, what am I going to start sounding like Moses or, you know, John the Baptist, you know, to telling my husband, repent, repent, turn from your ways. No, that's the ego would try to build it up into being some kind of inappropriate case, like you're a prophet or something. But actually, it's just let your yes be yes, let your no be no. And when you give your purpose over to going through through the forgiveness process, then it will come out in very helpful ways. Extremely helpful ways. I mean, extremely practically helpful ways. It will help improve everything that you perceive because you have a purpose of, of undoing the self-concept and of, of awakening. So, this is classic. You know, you can see he's, then he, he gets in the courtroom and as soon as the other opposing attorney says, you know, you have no case at all, he starts to like give his justifications, his lies, and begin to present his, his pseudo case. And the other lawyer uh, said he wouldn't, he wouldn't uh, even represent the same client unless he could represent her with honesty and integrity. And now he can't even say a word because he's, he's under the blessing of no lies, of the wish from his, his son. So this is giving us all kind of a good striking contrast of how when we people please, the only one that we're fooling is ourself. The only one we're trying to blow, pull the wool over eyes is our, is our own self, is our own mind. Every time we say a lie of convenience, every time we tell, sometimes people would say, well, it's just a tiny lie. I said, what do you mean a tiny lie? It's a white lie. Has anybody heard that, heard that phrase before? <laughs> a white lie? <laughs> That's trying to paint white paint on over something that's it's a deception. And he's basically at the point now where that's the comedy of this movie. Uh, he's, he's actually having to be authentic. The other thing I like about that is once the son made the wish, blew the candles out, and now he, he seems to not be able to tell a lie. The other thing I like about it is it's involuntary. It's totally, he has no choice now. And you know, that's what Jesus says at the beginning of the Course in the 50 Miracle Principles. Miracles are involuntary. He's actually <laughs> got a wish from his son for the miracle, and now he's in the blessing of, of his son's wish. 
his son's wish for honesty, for truth, his son's wish for happiness, his son's wish that for once his dad will say what he means and means what he says. His son has wished for the miracle and lo and behold, our Fletcher character is now in the involuntary flow of that. He cannot justify things. He has to speak things. He's speaking his, his stream of thoughts. Not that his thoughts are pure. <laughs> He's not reached the state of Jesus, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. No, he's, he's speaking a stream of wrong-minded thoughts, of judgments and justifications. But this is what's so helpful about the movie, because when he's acting it out in such an extreme, then you can start to bring it back to your own mind and go, well, there's some tendencies. I'm not as extreme as Fletcher, but you can start to notice wherever those tendencies are to try to justify something based on on a belief system, based on uh, a personality self, based on wanting to keep the mask held up, you know, based on wanting to hold on to the past. You can say it in, in many different ways, but that's, that's what all these justifications are that we throw out, is all based on keeping the status quo of the mask, keeping the mask in place. So here we go, we're ready for the first day of the trial, and he's in the involuntary state where he cannot tell a lie. <laughs> Did you see the meaning of that last scene? It had the whole salvation of the mind in it, if you could see it. He simply decided he would use, there's our picture up there, freeze frame, <laughs> as the pen is coming after him now, he decided he would use, just remember that face, the next time you think you can use your willpower against God's will. Because God's will is for perfect happiness, God's will is for truth, God's will is for spirit, God's will is for joy, God's will is for eternity, and the next time you believe you can use willpower for something in this world to try to change a behavior, to try to, to change an outcome, to try to change a situation, any time you are trying to use willpower. Some of you have been with me for these movies. You know, if you go back maybe five, six movies, you know, I was singing the Gary Puckett and the Union Gap song. Lady, willpower, it's now or never. And you know, I was singing that because willpower, Jesus actually says in the Course, he says, he, he quotes from the Bible, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And he says, will ye first the kingdom of heaven. He actually changes seek from the Bible and he, he retranslates it to will ye first. He's saying that the will, your will is so powerful that what you will will become your experience. And if you will to, to remember God, you cannot help but remember God. The will is that powerful. Now in this particular scene, he's convinced that he's going to use his willpower to lie. Because he tries to break the spell. You know, he's, he's in, he knows he's in big trouble. <laughs> he can't even imagine what this day will hold for him if he can't tell a lie. He's just like freaking out. You can see that he's trying to do everything that he can to use the power of his will to tell a lie. But he's unable to. He's in, the, he's in the involuntary nature of healing, which is the miracle. So, when you start to apply these teachings, they are amazing. They will take your mind into such a state of surrender that it's such a huge surrender that it's, it's, it's unfathomable. A couple days ago I was praying and I was 
asking like to really, really, really make it clear. And I remember Jesus had me go to lesson 135, if I defend myself I am attacked, longest lesson in the workbook uh, of all the lessons. And then he directed me down to the paragraph where he basically was giving the keys to spiritual awakening in one sentence. And, and I was just like, I, I just, I was like, oh my gosh. And he basically was talking about a defenseless, still, vibrant mind that is in line with the Creator. And he basically was saying, here's the conditions. So there's only three conditions. And this movie is making it very clear because it's very clear that if we try to use our will against the will of God, that we will end up with suffering and challenge, pain, and ultimately that's the wish for death to try to will apart from God. And God's will for us is perfect happiness, but that's His Spirit. So as long as we're trying to play this time-space identity game of being a separate self, then he said, here's the three conditions. That you cannot know the outcome in any situation. You cannot know the outcome which is best. Let's just look at that first one. You cannot know the outcome which is best. That means in any situation, look around at your house, look at your friends, look at your family. Think of what you've got planned for tomorrow what you've got planned for this weekend. Think about your goals, your ambitions, your thoughts of the future, and think that you cannot know the outcome which is best. You cannot know the outcome which is best. This little piece from Lesson 135 is really a reflection of I do not perceive my own best interest. In, not only that, but he says, in no situation do you perceive your own best interest. He's saying that your mind is so deluded, it's so in confusion, it's so into disorientation, that in no, in no situation do you perceive your own best interest. You cannot know the outcome which is best. You cannot know the means by which the problem is solved. Oh, I can't know the outcome which is best in any situation, and now you're telling me I can't know the means to achieve the happiness. No, you can't know them because that's based on past learning. You have to be given the means. You need to call upon the miracle. You need to have the means given you. You cannot know them ahead of time. They're, they cannot be known by anything that you've ever learned in the past. And then the final one. You cannot recognize the problem that the plan was meant to solve. I cannot recognize the problem that the plan was meant to solve? That's right. In order to forgive, you can't even recognize the problem that the plan was meant to solve. Why is that so? Why do I have to be that clueless, Jesus, in order to come back to that state of mind? Is because he's saying, if you recognize the problem, then you are in the error. You cannot see beyond the error if you've already defined the problem. Even Einstein said the problem cannot be solved at the level of the problem. You, even Einstein, this great, great scientist said you have to transcend, you have to go to a higher level, you have to go to another level to solve the problem. Einstein would, would say all, all the time, whenever he would even be working on an equation or working out something scientifically and trying to figure something out, it was better when he just relaxed and let go of trying to solve the problem and had a pause, had one of these glorious pauses of stillness, because that's where the insights came to Einstein. That's where the, the brilliant discoveries came when he would relax and not be seeking to find the solution at the level of the problem. He would be shown intuitively. He was just an intuitive scientist. That's why he was, 
he was right on the first edge, the first verge of the quantum scientist because he was so humble that he didn't believe that he, as Albert Einstein, had to figure out how to solve the problem. He would just relax and let flesh, let it come in into his, from his intuitive mind, from his right mind. So this is no small scene because admittedly we have one of the great, greatest comedic actors in the history of the universe and now he's being attacked by a blue pen. But it's not important that the blue pen is after him. You can see his face, you know, he... You, it takes Jim Carrey to pull off being attacked by a blue pen, but he does it the best. Nobody does it better. He's doing it, but, but what I'm asking you to do is look at what's the motive under what's underneath it. His motive is that he said, okay, willpower. He's closed the door and he's gone into his office to use his willpower to lie because he's so accustomed to, to lie. He's so accustomed to justification. He's so accustomed to, to deceit that he's going to use his willpower. And that's the greatest kind of image to keep in your mind. Whenever I try to contradict the will of God, remember, which is for perfect happiness. <laughs> it's not like it's, it's a bad thing. <laughs> God's will for you is perfect happiness? Is that a problem? To the ego, that's a problem. The ego's like, oh no, no, I don't think so. No, no, you're a separate entity now and you better be proud of it. You better be proud of it because you're separate now. That's what your existence is. But, but when you try to go against the will of God, that's the kind of struggle. In one sense, the will of God is, is just perfect love and then all things work together, meaning there's nothing that contradicts the will of God. That's why all things work together for good. That's why Jesus says, let all things be exactly as they are, is because everything that's occurring is, is in perfect alignment if you see it with the Holy Spirit. And if you try to go with a will apart from God, you can't help but see contradiction. You can't help but see conflict. You can't help but see attack is basically what happens when you try to go against the will of God. So, I just, when I see this scene, I'm just thinking, there it is right there. He's, he simply believes there's a will apart from God, and, and he's acting it out for us in the most extreme manner that you could ever imagine. Well, this is kind of like Don Rickles' humor. It's called put-down humor, but underneath it, you can see our choice of what is funny still comes down to our ability to laugh if we don't take anything personally. You see, that, that is the key to the laughter. There was a moment there where the, where the boss had to just pause and everybody kind of was very tense and everybody was waiting and waiting and waiting, but what is that showing us, that scene, except that our mind has the power of interpretation. It's not the words that are spoken to you, it's not the actions that seem to occur, it's not what seems to happen in the world of form that upsets you. The only thing that upsets you is also the only thing that can bring you happiness and joy, which is interpretation. So every single instant, no matter what the ego would tell you, oh, you make me sad, you hurt my feelings. Remember when we were kids playing on the playground? You hurt my feelings. You know, it's all based on false cause and effect. And actually we always, always, always have the power of interpretation. So in this case, he was brought in by his boss to kind of set him up to say everything that she knew that he was thinking, but still the boss left because it was the power of interpretation. He simply could not believe that he could take any of those words or those thoughts seriously. 
And imagine if you use your own power of interpretation with the Holy Spirit to be able to choose how you feel, to be able to choose with the Holy Spirit. The only problem for the Son of God was that he remembered not to laugh. And the power of interpretation is the power of forgiveness. It's the power of not taking anything personally. I mean, at sometimes I'm sure you've had a scene or a scenario in your life when you seem to be having a bad day, and it goes from bad to worse, seemingly to worse to worse, and then at some point, one more thing happens, and you just burst into laughter. You absolutely burst into laughter. I had one of these moments when Lisa Fair and I were, I think, we were returning, we were supposed to get up in the morning and drive to an airport in, I think it was New Mexico, to return a rental car. And we were packing up the car at like four in the morning. It's cold, it's dark, we've got to get ready. We put our luggage into the car, into the rental car. It was like a, a big uh, town car. And we put all of our luggage in and then we were out there talking and then the car had automatic lock. It locked itself. It locked us out of the out in the dark at four o'clock in the morning in New Mexico when we had to go to the airport. And when that happened, I just burst into laughter. I was laughing so hard that tears were just coming down my face. Because it was just the, it was just finally the absurdity of the world <laughs> just dawned on me and I was laughing so hard, my face, I was crying, Lisa was laughing and we laughed for like five minutes straight out there in the cold and the dark with this car that when the door is locked. We just howled laughing. We laughed and laughed and laughed until finally she was crying too. She was laughing so hard. We were both crying. We were laughing so hard. And then she was able to just get the words out. Where In the middle of all her laughter she said, what are we going to do now? <laughs> As we were both howling laughing. But it was like a Lucille Ball episode, you know, where things go so wrong with Lucy and Ethel that that's what makes the scene funny. It's, you actually reach a point where you see it's out of control, that you have no control over the world. And it suddenly you just burst into laughter because it's so funny. So this is, this is what this scene means to me when I see it, because he's, he was brought in there with the motive of kind of exposing his thoughts, but actually it just showed beautifully the power of interpretation. You can even practice. Imagine that you were, you're on your deathbed, you know. You're laying there and you seem to be dying. And Jesus even talks about this in the Manual for Teachers. He said, even at the point of death, you could merely rise up and say, I have no need for this. Isn't that lovely? Keep, keep that one, keep that card in your pocket. You play the old Holy Spirit laughter card. Even at the point of death, you can merely rise up and say, I have no need for this at all. He's planting seeds. That's a pretty extreme seed. Even at the point of death, you could merely, the patient could merely rise up. He's just again teaching the same thing. You have the power of interpretation. No scene, no scenario, no situation can depress you. No situation can make you fearful because you have the power of interpretation. And that is giving you the power to choose love, to choose the Holy Spirit. Now some of you have done less than 136 from A Course in Miracles. Sickness is a defense against the truth. And you tell me you don't understand what that lesson's talking about. Sickness is a decision. Sickness is a decision in the mind. Nothing makes you sick. No, the coronavirus doesn't. No, there aren't 
radiation things coming from the sun. There aren't nutritious things with food, food poisoning. When the mind feels guilty, it projects the guilt, this is the attempt, it projects the guilt to the body to draw forth a witness of frailty, of weakness, of vulnerability, and this is just like a, in a court trial where you try to call a witness. The mind is very powerful, but when the mind feels guilty, it calls forth a witness to its own weakness, to its belief in vulnerability. And so, this scene in the bathroom, again, this is another scene that is highly illustrative of what's going on in the mind. And basically when the guy is says to him, what are you doing to yourself? He basically says, don't you see I'm trying to kick my ass, do you mind? The mind is always doing it to itself. It's always kicking itself. Whenever you have self-critical thoughts, whenever there's thoughts of unworthiness, whenever there's thoughts of, of self-judgment in some way, shape, or form, that's what generates the guilt. And then Jesus comes along and says, the mind was sick that thought the body could be sick. So the evidence seems to be very strong only because of the belief that the body can be sick. Only because of the belief that the body can be harmed. It's, a, it's an image. It's a projection. It's a projection onto the screen of the world and the mind tries to take the guilt and tries to make it into some concretized form of illness. But this whole attempt is totally insane. It's actually impossible. And, and that's part of the forgiveness, is starting to realize the power of the mind and also recognizing that you are not the body, which is our workbook lesson, if you're doing those workbook lessons, I'm not a body, I am free. And that the key thing is, is that the mind cannot be sick. So basically, Jesus gives this as like a, a gateway to, to health. Of course, he's, he's talking about health of the mind because the body can't be sick, the body can't be well. It's just an image. It's a, it's a trick. It's a projection to try to maintain and keep guilt. So basically, he says, if you would know that you are healed, you have to follow this. I am not a body and my mind cannot attack, so I cannot be sick. That's it. One, two, three. Divine logic. I am not a body, and my mind cannot attack, so I cannot be sick. But when you hold on to self-critical thoughts, this is the belief that mind can attack. This is where the guilt comes in. It's all based on the thoughts. It's not based on the actions of the body. In fact, when you start to go through this healing experience, you'll have an epiphany that you'll realize that the body has never done anything wrong or right. And that all those decisions you seem to make as a person, where you call them wrong decisions and right decisions, persons don't make wrong decisions or right decisions. Persons are projections of the mind. And basically, when you bring it back to your mind, you just see, it's either right-minded, which is pure innocence, or wrong-minded, which is the belief that attack is real. What does that even mean, attack in the mind? It simply means that you believe you can separate from God. That's how deep it goes. We're not just talking about judgments of a body, of being too much this way, too much that way. I wish I was better at this than that. That's, that's not it. That's still, those are not the core attack thought. The core attack thought is the belief in separation from God. The belief that you could attack the mind of God, the belief that you could pull your mind apart from the mind of God is the ego. And so the ego is, in essence, the only attack thought. 
and all seeming judgments and criticisms are just the ego. It seems to be legion, but it's just one thought. And, and that's this part of the mind training of the Course, of just starting to see the ego exactly as it is. Because if you come to that awareness that sickness is a decision, then you have the option of choosing again. Remember I said there's another interpretation available. You can actually choose again. But you must come to the awareness of the impossibility of attack. Attack takes two. You have to have an attacker and an attackee. One mind, it doesn't make any sense that there could be attack. If, 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 we're, if you're one mind, if mind is one, there isn't the two that's required for the attack. Like even the ego says, yeah, God is God and you've left God and now you're separate from God and therefore there's the two. God and then ah, something else. That's not God, that's not spirit. So these are profound scenes, but this, this is like, again, Jim Carrey is really acting out for us. He's thinking he, he needs to get out of this trial in some way. And so he decides when he's in the bathroom, his so-called ego, Eureka, is that if he is damaged enough that that will be his, what, justification for not continuing. There's the word again, it's another justification. All these ego thoughts are simply justifications for a false self. Every single ego thought, without exception, is just a justification. So the next time you're in a situation where you feel you have a decision to make, and you have a choice between telling the truth, really just speaking what's in your heart, or an ego justification, remember this point in the bathroom, that this is just another justification. And all of us can relate to this. Anytime we want to avoid something, avoid a situation, avoid a person, avoid anything in this world, the ego says, here, just use this little justification for why you can't do it. I mean, I, I remember when I was going through this, this workbook lesson that I used to, I was praying to Jesus and I was saying, show me, show me, I have to see this, I have to see this. And he said, yes, yeah, sickness is a decision. When you're trying to justify or avoid something, then you use the justification of, of sickness. You make yourself sick to prove that you're little and weak and worthless and you're not a perfect holy child of God. You choose sickness because you're afraid of love. Really? Really? Can you give me an example, Jesus? Can you give me like one example in my life where I've done that? And he said, yeah, remember when you were, you were like 13 years old? I'm like, yeah. And you hated to go to church? Yeah. But you didn't want to let your mother and your dad down because they, they expected you to be in church? Yeah. Remember that time you were in your room and you were just there and you were thinking, if I just had a fever, then I could get out of going to church. Yeah. And remember he, Jesus said how you just, you, you made yourself sick. You laid in bed and you got more and more in a feverish state until you finally touched the forehead, and you went, I've done it. I have a fever. <laughs> Mom, come in here! <laughs> and how you called your mother in, and you laid there in bed, and you said, Mom, I feel really hot. Maybe you should touch my forehead. Oh, David, you've got a fever. You can't go to church. This is what Jesus does. If you're honest, 
If you honestly say, come on now, I would not make myself sick, Jesus would say, oh really? Oh really? You think every time you get a cold, you think it's germs? You think it's viruses? You should watch the George Carlin clip <laughs> on viruses. <laughs> he, he didn't believe in them. <laughs> but he was another genius comedian, and he does a whole five-minute skit on the impossibility of germs. And it's all just a lie. You have an immune system, and it's all, it's all, it comes down to your own uh, immune system. But actually, when you really are honest, you can start to realize, I have done this to myself, and it is this that I would undo. It's absurd. Yes, it's insane that sickness is a decision. But Jesus is saying, well, just take an honest look at it with me and see that the reason you did it, okay, when you were 13, all right, why? What was the reason I did it? Is because you were trying to avoid an outcome. And you were justifying, you were coming up with a justification where you could avoid an outcome without letting your mom down. And you made yourself sick. Wow. So it was still a justification thought. I still was trying, I was generating a fever so I could people please my mother. Yeah, that's right. You, you did that. At 13 years old, that's what you did. Got me. <laughs> this is the kind of thing, when you do a workbook lesson, if you're really honest and you don't understand something that Jesus is telling you, you can just ask him. You can say, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. Can you give me an example? And he'll give you as many examples as you want <laughs> until you go, okay. Uh, all right, okay, I, I, I got me here, okay, I, you know, you're exposing this, you know, and then he's going to say, now, wouldn't you rather follow the Holy Spirit and learn to live your yes is yes and your no is no? You know, that would have been a thing. Mom, can you come in here? Can I talk to you a minute? I really don't like going to church. Why? Because it's boring. The minister's boring. You see how different that is to just be open and to just speak it up and just to say it. Instead of using your mind's power, your seeming mind power with the ego, to come up with some kind of justification. And that's what he's doing here in this bathroom scene. He is literally projecting his guilt about the case and his inability to lie. He's projecting it onto the body in a pretty extreme way. But that's just, and that's what the value of the movie is. Sometimes it takes extreme examples to point out, oh, this is what goes on in the mind. And that's where the value is. Okay. Here we go. He's got he's to gotta get out of that bathroom. <laughs> he's terrified of the questions now. Because now he knows he can't tell a lie. So he's terrified of the questions that even precede the answers. Because why? Because his motive was to win the trial. And everything that comes out of his mouth is is not helpful in him winning the trial. So now he's objecting to himself. <laughs> the, the judge is pointing out, you know, you're objecting to yourself, you're objecting to your own questions. And this is actually quite profound because as soon as you change your purpose for this world, you may actually find things coming out of your mouth that, that the ego can't believe that you're saying. It can't believe how open you, you're becoming. It can't believe how openly transparent you're becoming. Because it's, it's threatening to the ego, it's threatening to the belief in the self-concept, it's threatening to everything that the ego has planned for you. It's threatening to death. It's threatening to you opening up to your happiness. It's 
the, the Holy Spirit coming through you is the greatest threat to the ego because you're going to start teaching what you would learn. And even the questions can start to bring an uneasiness to the ego. When you start questioning what you believe, that's threatening to the ego. The ego doesn't want you questioning what you believe. It just wants you to believe what you believe <laughs> and continue to believe what you believe. That you're little, that you're worthless, that you're never going to wake up, that you're never going to be able to get this, learn this course, that you're never going to be able to forgive. The ego doesn't want you to actually start questioning what you believe because it's afraid of the questions. Just like in this scene, our Fletcher character, the lawyer, he's afraid of the questions. He's terrified to even ask the questions because of where it's leading. And then he goes through this part where he tries to cancel out the questions and finally his witness comes and admits to everything that happened with Mrs. Cole and that's the last thing that he wanted exposed. So he is terrified of the questions. So I think this is a good point for everybody. When you start asking questions, maybe you're journaling with Jesus and you start to question things. You start to question your perception of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the ego doesn't like that. The ego wants you to hang on to your old perception of things, your judgmental perception. The ego doesn't want you questioning your perception of this world. It wants you to just stay tight and hold on for, quote, dear life. It's life in the body. It wants you to hold on to that. So, I know from, for myself that the, some of the greatest insights I've ever had, some of the greatest mystical experiences have come when I would allow a certain question up into awareness from the unconscious mind. And then I whoosh, would have a big whoosh, a big insight. Because I allowed certain questions to be asked. You may say, can you be, can you be a little more specific, David? You know, here's a question for you. You can ask yourself, am I happy? You see, the ego doesn't really like you to ask that question. <laughs> it doesn't really like that question. Am I happy? Because if you're not really joyfully, extremely happy, then the ego doesn't even want you to begin to go down that rabbit hole and ask yourself, am I happy? Because it wants you to stick with the status quo. It wants you to stick with the self-concept. It wants you to stay stuck in the past. My gosh, if you start asking yourself, am I happy? What That may open up a whole can of worms. Then, then you've got a whole can of worms to look at. I like that. I mean, I'd be like, okay, am I happy? Okay, what else you got for me, Jesus? All right. You know, you start to be, you start to open up with Jesus and be honest, like, okay, all right, okay. All right, you show me what's going on in my mind that I'm so unhappy. <laughs> you know, this is how it starts when you start to be honest. Am I happy? Okay, Jesus, show me the way. So this is, actually, it's another dramatic scene from, from Jim Carrey, but he's acting things out for all of us to show us in the extreme what the dynamics of the ego are, and how once we see it, we can start to choose again. We don't, we don't have to hold on to these dynamics anymore. All right. So, so this is clearly a moment where he's starting to re-evaluate his priorities. This is relating to what I was le mentioning in Lesson 135 about you cannot know the outcome which is best. In no situation do you know the outcome which is best. He was basing everything he was saying on winning the trial 
and that this would be a good outcome and that it would bring him a partnership and now the the man in the law firm who who is capable of offering the partnership says congratulations partner and he shakes his hand but he's not happy and he watches what happens with the dad and the kids you know being taken away by their mother and he's not happy see the 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 problem is that as long as the mind believes in the ego, it has lost its ability to know what happiness is. And so it just bases all of its motives and all of its strivings and all of its ambitions on the ego, because of the ego belief system. But the ego is incapable of knowing anything. That's why Jesus says in no situation do you know what your own best interest is? In no situation do you know the outcome which is best. It's, to believe in the ego is such a profound con conclusion about identity that, that it makes discerning anything in time and space an impossible task. In fact, Jesus, at one point he says, this world is an impossible situation. How do we think that we could know what's the best outcome in an impossible situation, in an impossible time-space identity that was set up by the ego? How would we think we would know what's best? So, to me, this is the depth of how, when we go to, into mysticism, when we go into forgiveness, all we're really doing is letting go of, of an ability that we never had in the first place, which was judgment. God never created us to judge. God created us as spirit. God did not create us for time and space. And Jesus says, the Son of God can only know himself, only know spirit in the environment in which he was created. And that environment is, is actually spirit. It's not time and space. So basically what Jesus is telling us is you can never know perfect happiness until you wake up and you know your creator. And even that is very humbling because if the goal is happiness, if we really are opening to happiness, then we, we know that, that time and space will never provide that happiness. The closest we can come is a forgiven world, is a happy dream, where we, we give up trying to judge anything, and we surrender into a, a beautiful, pristine, still state of mind that is a holistic way. It's the Holy Spirit's way of looking at the world. But this is, I think it's a very powerful scene right there, because everything that he was doing was being done with a motive of trying to win the case. And that's why he was freaking out, because without a, being able to tell a lie, everything that was coming out of his mouth, or even that he was anticipating coming out of his mouth, in terms of the question, was all terrifying to him, because it was in opposition to his goal, of his ego goal of winning, winning the case. And then, when he seems to win the case, uh, He's now in a place of, of wondering if that's really what he truly wants. He's starting to think about his connection with his son. Maybe he's starting to think of this connection with his, with his ex-wife. He's starting to reevaluate everything in his mind based on the desire to, to no true happiness, and realizing that the values that he served before and the goals that he pursued before were not bringing him happiness. So, yeah, this is a beautiful, it's like a humble moment. He's, a, he's, he's played a pretty freaked out character, but he's got a very humble look on his face right now. He's very, very open. Need some change. Do you, do you pick up a change of attitude here? When he's decided to align, oh Esther, isn't it amazing? When he's just decided to change his purpose 
and align with the truth, he's so happy. He's not stressed, he's not freaked out. He's just running with happiness. He's brimming with happiness. He's running up to the guy and he's saying, do you need some change? Whereas before he was always avoiding the guy. He didn't want to tell him the truth, but now he's asking, do you need some change? So to me, this is like the spectacular scene. It just is a huge scene of showing you that if you change your purpose in your mind, that's where the happiness comes from. It doesn't come from searching for outcomes in the world. It doesn't come from trying to make better situations or to get better outcomes in the world. As soon as he changes his mind, his secretary shows up for him in prison and bails him out. And he makes a joke about starting his own firm. She makes a joke back to him. You, you know, maybe you can't afford me. And they both laugh. You see, the miracle just sends ripple effects of love just from the change of mind, just from the change of purpose. Everything changes. This is how powerful the mind is. If you change your mind about what your purpose is, if you have that talk tonight with Jesus where you just, in the quiet of your heart, you just go, okay, you were right. <laughs> you were right. You were right. I, I would better off be wrong about my ego pursuits and my goals in this world, but I, you were right. I'm better off because you're right. And you are right about this forgiveness, this change of purpose thing. And so I just think it's so spectacular because nothing really has changed <laughs> so far in this movie except when he changed his purpose. Whoa! Quantum expansion. Whoa! Happiness. Happiness is raining down. It's just raining down. And it doesn't matter that, that his son is on the way to the airport to, to fly to Boston because he's now turned into Mr. Happiness, <laughs> you know, because, because of his change in his mind. Frankly, he just changed his priorities, you know. He went from trying to succeed as a lawyer and trying to become partner and doing everything for a future goal of, of self-concept goal. And now he has released it and, and his, his uh, radiant love energy has now been turned loose on the whole world. So let's see what happens at this point. They're on to me. <laughs> They're on to me. <laughs> oh. Sweet. Beautiful. That was our uplifting movie. <laughs> oh, so sweet. Yeah, it just, it really reminds us of that this uh, awakening can be fun. I mean, when you really look at all the, how profound the wisdom is, but also uh, just the happiness and the, uh, the joy of, of that, even those outtakes, that's what I remember. <laughs> the outtakes are, are spectacular, you know, because they have, you can have fun with this as you're willing to shift your, your purpose. I mean, I've put out all these different books, but I always say the, the best, the best book is a, is a little teeny pamphlet called Purpose is the Only Choice. And all it is is about just honestly seeing you can change your mind about your mind. You can change your purpose. You can do it now. You know, it's, it, you don't have to uh, prolong things. You know, this kind of movie is like a witness that you can really do it now. You don't have to wait to change your purpose. You don't have to think, oh, how long is it going to take before I change my mind? You can be in, so inspired by, by this movie that you really see the value of just changing the purpose for the world, you know. Instead of futurizing, instead of thinking one day, one day, one day, you know, it's, it, 
it ultimately comes down to the devotion, the, the willingness to change, change the purpose. So I'm ready and happy to hear what you all are sharing. I see Esther's got her hand going up right away. I could see from your face, Esther, that was a hugely healing movie. Because <laughs> you were, you were, your face was contorting there as you were going through the healing as much as Jim Carrey's. But yeah, maybe you can share with us uh, what happened. What was going on there? Well, today I had, I had like an unbelievable time with my mother. We went to the safety deposit box to check out what she had there. And turns out that it's almost empty. And she was so shocked that she kept saying someone else had been there to take her, her things. And I just stayed with her. I stayed with her. I did what you said in one of the other movie times. How do you feel, mommy? How do you feel? And I, I didn't, I told her that what you said about when something isn't um, there for you anymore, that if someone stole your money, for example, that it was meant to be that way and that it was God's will that it would be that way and that you really don't have a choice in it. You have a choice in how you feel about the whole thing. So I talked to her about that. And, um, but my point is that all the things from today's movie were coming up for me, like with how to help her and help myself. We were both stunned. There was supposed to be like a certain number of gold coins there and there were only three left. And I had counted on that and I knew there was a lesson for me there before I even went there. I said, let me not expect anything. Let me not expect outcomes. Let me just be present and whatever is going to be, it's going to be. And she was so happy I was there with her to experience this with her. And she just, I just wanted to ask you, how, how else can I, if you give me something, I can have her listen to it with me about how she can process this for herself. Because I told her that what you said at the guidance retreat, that loss is inconceivable. I mean, that suffering is inconceivable to the Holy Spirit. And she was like, really? And I was like, yeah, inconceivable. And she says, this is all philosophy. But I told her an example of how the Holy Spirit had me raise like $400,000 for a, an investment thing. And I lost all of it except 14000 And um, it was a, a misused funds. And, uh, but I got 400000 when my father passed. And I told her that whatever comes to you, if it leaves you, it's meant to be reorganized. That It's not really a loss. That's my understanding. And I just, with her, it comes to her in waves, you know, the shock and the, the, and she wants to believe that God is willing. Everything she says used to be was God, God is willing, God, God willing, I will do this, God willing. So I want to talk to her in those terms that, and I, I want to also know for myself that this is in fact the case, that the Holy Spirit doesn't take away what isn't what's necessary will be given. Yeah. Well, I think the thing that helped me was, as I was just open to changing my purpose for the whole world, that, that then you start to see everything in this world is just symbolic. So, so money isn't what it seemed to be, and things aren't what they seem to be, and even relationships aren't. It's if you start to think of like, okay, this is a dream. So, so in the dream, the Holy Spirit will reach me through what I believe in, which is the dream. So, dream symbols. So, when you said, you know, you got there, you opened the safety deposit box, and there was just three coins. I was thinking, well, that's the Trinity. I, I'm thinking the one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. I mean, that's just how my mind works. I'm like. Wow, three coins, that's, that's profound. You've got one for each of the Trinity. And then, like, I remember watching the movie Titanic. Did you see the movie Titanic? You know, and, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, and then, and then um, Kate Winslet playing, you know, Rose, and it's a love story. And there, it's narrated, it's narrated by this woman who's recalling, you know, the love story that happens where she goes on there and she falls in love 
uh, and she gets to go stand at the very front. Remember how Leonardo holds her? And, and she's just like soaring in the front of the Titanic, and they're falling in love. It's a, it's a love story. It's a love story. And then, of course, you know, the Celine Dion song, you know, My Heart Goes On, you know, I'm just in the theater. <sighs> James Horner music, and I'm, ah, my heart's exploding as I'm watching this great song. And then at the end, the ship goes down. You know, it's pretty much, even the architect says, oh, it's sunk because he knows how many compartments, how many compartments have to fill up with water. So he knows hours before it's even happened. It, he's like, script is written. You know, when they ask him, he knows it's gone. He knows that ship is going down without even it going down. He knows because of an internal knowing. And then at the very end, as it's this elderly lady, it's Rose. She's much older. She's telling the whole story. And she recalls that there was this giant diamond called the, the jewel, I think it was the jewel of the ocean. This massive, massive, multi-million dollar diamond in today's terms. You know, it's a massive diamond. And as she's telling the story... You know, everybody's wondering whatever happened to the jewel of the ocean, which is to me is symbolic of the world. Jewelry is just a, a shiny symbol. It sparkles, but really it's not worth anything. You know, in eternity, you know, this, this diamond is, the, is nothing. And she's got it, and she's got it, and she's, she's, you see, she's got it. She's got the jewel, you know. And is that the end of the movie? No. She goes, whoops. <laughs> She tosses it back into the ocean. The jewel goes back in the ocean. That tiny little drop of a, of a of a pendant of a necklace goes back into the ocean. That's what we're all doing. You know, to me, that's that's very symbolic. When she goes, "Whoops," and and I felt this ooh, huge rush of love because the whole song was "My Heart Goes On." The whole Everything in the movie was meant to just teach with that one scene in the end where she she drops off the the jewel. The, it was never about the jewel, you know. That's what the world, the ego would make it about, a, a, a jewel. The ego makes it about money. The ego makes it about fame and all kinds of things. But in the end, I see what you're describing is just that was a witness to your mind. Of, of your starting to really realize in your heart what's valuable. And that's why when you, when we had those scenes in this movie, you know, you just had the tears flowing. Your, your face was just, your mask was cracking. You, your, your face, you were just crying. You, you know, because we have to cry when we have this realization of all this love that we've always been loved. We've been so deeply loved. We've, we've been loved eternally and we just, went for the glitter of of the world, of time and space. So I know how deeply you loved your father, and now you're getting to have these beautiful lessons of love and forgiveness occur with your mother, you know, during this time when she's making preparations, you know, to to pass things on and to pass on you're there with her right in the middle of the experience and you're being given these beautiful symbols. And they aren't always what you would expect. Like you said, both of you and your mother were like, what the heck is this? <laughs> yeah, just tell her, I told you, it's one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. And then, then you can laugh, you know, then you can see more of this beautiful humor and playfulness. Because in the end, we can't take it with us. That's a, that's a movie that I love. What is that, 1929, black and white? You can't take it with you. Lionel Barrymore. The same, the same actor that played Scrooge <laughs> in this movie, 1929, he plays the grandpa. And it's a total... I, now I always remember Lionel Barrymore for, for his loving portrayal of grandpa and... You know, and what does Scrooge even mean? I, I don't believe in that anymore. So thank you. Oh, you got another one. Okay. So can I take this opportunity to ask you a question? That's um, sure. 
May, yeah. I don't know if I can relate it to the movie exactly, but maybe we can. Um, the, um, the, 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 the special needs trust that my mom wants to set up, there's hardly any money to put in it in the first place, but I think I should still have it set up. That's the guidance I'm getting. But it has a clause called the trust protector clause. And it, and it also states that if the person in charge of the trustee in charge of the clause um, makes a mistake, like uh, I lose my benefits, then he can't be the trustee anymore. And I want to take that out, that, that wording out. And I just don't, I also, I, I want to have the idea, the trust protector would be able to take the trustee off of the as position also and would be char charging money for their services and stuff like that. And the law firm that we're using for the trust is saying that they'll be the one to assign a trust protector if one is necessary. And all this just makes me so uncomfortable. And I was told that we could take the trust protector clause out, but it has some features in it that may be necessary. So I'm like, maybe we, I don't know what to do. I'm, I well, talked to the lawyer on Friday and I just, I just, I'm like, there's nobody I can ask because nobody knows anything about this. Yeah. Well, think of it this way. I just told you about the, the three coins and the symbolism. Now let's use this example because when you're speaking, I'm hearing it so clear. You're saying you're concerned about the trust protector. Who is really the trust protector? It's the Holy Spirit. So, and, and then you're uncomfortable with the trust protector being taken out. Yeah, you're uncomfortable with the Holy Spirit <laughs> being taken out because you need that trust protector. But you see how this is part of the cosmic humor that, that Jesus is, is laughing with you saying, listen, listen, you've got to really remember this, Esther. You remember that it's symbols. <laughs> And when you remember that it's symbols, oh my gosh, it's so profound. You know, you don't want the trust protector taken out. You don't want the Holy Spirit taken out. You want to remember the Holy Spirit, and that's where you're laughing, like right now. So you see how, this is how Jesus and the Holy Spirit work. It just retranslates everything to symbolism. And that's, in the end, how, how like for, for this belief in loss, Basically, in the end, loss is, the belief in loss is just a, a call for love. And the Holy Spirit is an excellent expert at transforming and reinterpreting what seems to be a horrifying idea to, to bringing it back to the love. That basically, it's, it's a call for love. And it's our own call for love, too. It's not, not somebody else's call, you know. So, thank you. You're showing, you're just showing us so many examples. We just got a double dip of ice cream tonight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, 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 sweet, sweet. Okay, well, it looks like we have a hand up there in Mexico. So I'll go ahead and unmute you, Mexico. David, hello, everyone. Hi, Lori. The world will end in laughter. <laughs> Thank you, Ruby. This is an answer prayer. We were one mind because this is hysterical, this movie. Um, yeah, just, I just, what do I want to say? Just um, a few weeks ago, you and Francis prayed for the direct experience of the love, of the love, love of the Father. And um, and then the song Quantum Love has been coming in really strong for me. And the lyrics are, daring to let it in, daring to let it be, daring to allow, to be given everything. And I love the line, as you, you might have picked up, <laughs> A heart breaking wide open and um, I feel that I, I feel like my heart is breaking wide open 
um, under the guidelines, no people pleasing, no private thoughts, the love that is in this constellation, Anna being here to receive us. I mean, like just so much gratitude. So I've been feeling that my heart is breaking open. And I, in that, I feel the limitlessness of the quantum. So we prayed for that direct experience, and I don't know what anything's for, but I just love that he could not people please. He had these like no people pleasing blinders on. And there's such freedom in that, you know, there's such freedom. And that's kind of like what it seems is up for me. Like I feel like I've seen a pattern of putting others on a pedestal. Um people pleasing saying yes when i mean let me pray about that or just feeling what the heart what that what the communication of the heart is and when i feel that heart closing i know that's like okay breathe you don't have to say yes right now and um but the, that brings up like tremendous fear to let your yay be yay and your your no be no. And maybe your yeah, maybe your no, maybe your yes says I changed my mind turns into I changed my mind, or the no turns into I want to. After letting the quantum speak, so um, I guess if I just just want to express my gratitude. Um, And I just want, and I know you've probably said it a million times, David, but I just want to ask you if you could sum up the little black book and, and what do you mean that you changed your purpose? If you could share on that for us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, thank you. What a beautiful, what a beautiful testimony. Well, you know, it's, I did a video, uh, it's on YouTube, called Seek Not to Change the Changing. And so this world is, is, appears to be a very much of a changing world. And the temptation is to try to get our fingers in there. And that's where the, the people pleasing and the, the doing things for approval and all those crazy, 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 crazy things come in. And so when I asked Jesus at a time about what does it mean, you know, uh, that I need to have a different purpose and I need to, what does it mean to have to change my mind? What does that even mean? What, how could I do that? What could that mean? He was just saying, he just said, change your mind about your mind. He said, don't try to change the world because it's like a veil. And when you start to tinker around and try to change the veil, it's, it seems like endless, you know. It's like you're going down a dark pit uh, with, with uh, no light. But when I asked him, what does it mean to change my mind? He said, he said to accept your changelessness, to accept your being, to accept the grace of God to accept yourself as God created you. God created you eternal. And even though you've tried to play this game of time, it, it hasn't changed anything. It, you can't change the will of God. You can't change God. You can't change the creation of God. You're so precious. You're innocent. You're forever innocent. There's nothing you can do to, to mar your innocence. There's nothing you can do to mess it up. You know, yeah, yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, it's like strong, because that's where the joy, that's heart breaking wide open. In fact, while you're speaking, here's Kirsten right here, and Kirsten was, was you were driving one time between Salt Lake City and uh, Camas, and she had to pull the car over, because this love is not romantic. This love <laughs> cannot be contained. It's, you know, it, it's all we wanted, it's who we are. Hearts breaking wide open under Christ's control. So, so yeah, you're speaking right there, you're 
talking about the, the purpose is the only choice, and Kirsten's right here, and Kirsten received all those lyrics, and now your heart's breaking wide open with those uh, same lyrics, because it's like the spirit is reaching you. It's just reaching right into your heart, and and that's what you need. You know, you need the strength of that to let your yes be yes and let your no be no. To not to not blink, to not be concerned, because it's only concern for the body and the future that you know that brings out. That's the only reason we ever even would attempt to play small, is where we think we have to. You know, somehow we have to believe. Will you love me? Will you accept me? You know, if I play this game, and Jesus is saying, "Oh no, no, don't! You're worth more than that game. You don't have to play that game anymore. We don't have to think like that anymore. We're free." <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. There's our beaming co-living. <laughs> Co-living Mexico. <laughs> they start off dancing and now they look like they're ready to fly. <laughs> oh, precious. Precious, precious. Thank you. Okay, I see Stephen has his hand up. I'll unmute you, Stephen. Got it? Hey. Um, wow, good stuff. This was so much fun tonight. Every, every time is good. And so thank you once again, David and, and Living Miracles, for putting this together because I just find it so very helpful. You know, we can study the text and we can uh, understand the teachings and, uh, but it, but, and have our relationships and then put it into practice. And then we get to have the fun of seeing stuff like this and this movie come through. So, so, so funny, really. A lot of gems in there for me tonight. Um, the, the truth stuff is, he said, this truth stuff is pretty cool. <laughs> it's like, amen to that. Yeah, it, it, it's, there's no better game. I, you know, it, it, I, I was thinking about that. And then um, I love the catch at the end where he's, uh, he's telling Fletcher, uh, you out of, are you out of your mind? Are you out of your mind? Because he went through all this these, uh, heroism to, to make that connection. And are you out of your mind? He says, no, I'm thinking clear. I've never been this clear. And I thought, well, that's true. It's like when, when yeah, when, when we turn to our right mind and we allow and align our will, I'm finding that that's so profoundly clear. And then, of course, we've talked about it many times, and for everybody, the contrast grows greater and greater in terms of which thought system is, is really at work here. And I, and I love that. It's like, no, it's, it's crystal clear. And how could it not be clear? And in the humor of this movie, it's so very clear. And, but, but we're for sure going to be bounced around because – what I loved about that scene from the bathroom where he's in a pickle and, and he's, he's, before he starts beating up on himself, he, 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 he has his mantra and his mantra is think, think, think. And I, and I love that. I'm thinking, yeah, that's just thinking, thinking. That's what gets you. That's what gets me into the pickle is trying to figure the way out and, and to think, think, think. And then of course we're going to beat up on ourselves and we're going to be, um, I wrote down, we're like, um, he's, he's badgering the witness. Well, of course, then we'll start badgering the witnesses that come our way. And it's really us. That badgering of the witness is like a dog barking in the mirror. And, and, and it's just, it's, it's okay, this message keeps coming through. I also loved when um, it was talking about Max at the end of the movie. And it says, looks like he's got his father back. And I thought, oh, that's that, yeah, that's referring to, to Max, the son and the father. But that's really what happens, I, I feel, when I am just returning to that right-minded point of view, and then everything's funny. Like you said, David, the, the cosmic humor, humor of everything, you just, it's just you're catching everything, and it's, it's actually very, very humorous when, in, until it's not. And then when it's not, it's like, okay, let me 534 this puppy and, and, and get back to peace. And then that's really, really helpful in this humor. Just you can, I can see so many aspects in here. The whole law thing really resonated for me because – yeah, as a lawyer, you're trained to um, represent represent a point of view. Well, the point of view is always from some victim or victimizer or some battle going on. So you take on that night um, aspect to rep represent the conflict. And I think that uh, one of the things about that word attack, uh, when I was looking up the um, etymology of that word, the origins of that word, part of it comes from, I think it's the French, which is atacare 
which means to join in. You're, you're joining in the conflict. You're, you're, you're saying, okay, I'm, I'm going in there, and here comes the battle, here comes the sword. We're going to represent the conflict, which is just a replay of the original choice uh, for separation. So I, I, I think that's kind of funny, and, and particularly for my dream, the parable of Stephen, I get to... I get to navigate these wonderful, this wonderful waters of the mental health system, the behavioral health system, and all the mental health providers and the legal system uh, for court order treatment and watching how all of these, it's just, it's funny. And, 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 and until we had the shutdown, we would have to appear, you know, in person at the hearings and now we do it telephonically. And it's not as funny because I don't get to interact with people and not take it seriously and throw mob jokes out there. I'm, I'm the goofball that's, having a good time with it, frankly. And yes, you got to play your part and you, you can't step over too, too many boundaries because you'll have judges just thinking you're way too goofy. But I, I've just been having fun with that. And um, I, I really like this movie, David. I want to say thank you and, and uh, the interpreter, that, that aspect you were talking about, the interpretation. And then we have to reinterpret. We have the power to reinterpret. And I, I interpret that as, yes, I need my interpreter. I cannot leave the house. I cannot go anywhere. Um, unless I have my interpreter with me because I, I need everything reinterpreted from that holy point of view. And then it just becomes hilarious and everything becomes fun. I had this, I had this text today that I wrote and, and, and oddly enough, and, you know, and I'll, I'll read you the, the text, but it was to a, a, a colleague and we were trying to sort out where a point of view was coming from. And we couldn't understand the point of view with the problem that we were trying to understand. How could this person come come from this point like what were they really trying to say here's what came to me and, and, and it struck me and then when this movie started playing tonight and you you did the setup and I thought that's where that text came from and I, and I wrote this and I, and I wrote I said if you are coming from a split mind then you are speaking with a forked tongue and your messages will be mixed if you are coming from your right mind then it is not you that is speaking but the voice of integrity and your messages will ring true. And it just, that just floated in, and, and, and the waters parted, and the clarity came, and it just said, okay, who are we doing this with? And understanding that in the world's point of view, and, and there is a certain point of view that's coming from a split mind and a forked tongue. And so don't be surprised if the next messages are hard to interpret from that level. But thank you for sharing those other thoughts of, no, you got to get, you got to get above that battleground to have that reinterpreted for you to see where it's coming from and how, how I'm interpreting it. But anyway, this was so much fun. There was, uh, again, no doubt for no doubt for no doubt. That was funny. That was funny. Um, the whole lawyer gag really struck me as funny. Uh, Jim Carrey, uh, just an incredible comedian and being able to push that stuff up and, and, and help me to see that in even a deeper sense of humor and your um, commentary on it really just kind of brings it on home. And it's like, how can, how can we, how could we um, possibly entertain a, a non-right-minded way of thinking? And it's like, well, I will. I'm, I'm pretty sure <laughs> I often do. But there's the fun, there's the humor in it for me of saying ah, the contrast is so great. But thank you so much. Uh, this was fun. This was a, this was really fun. Beautiful. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Yeah, I liked. I I still like that Susie Kurtz and what she said about overacting, because what in the outtake, it was like, you could see that they're having so much fun that that, that starts to blur between the scene of acting and actuality. You know, it, it brings it all, it merges everything together. So that idea that there are no dress rehearsals, that we're not doing this for something else, this is it. You know, it's like it's, it's just unified mind, and I love those kind of uh, little symbols because they just, they, she made the joke, that's overacting, he burst into laughter, everybody is laughing, and then she said, he put me up to it, you know, that you could see that that was not a, they weren't in a moment, that wasn't a job, they weren't, they weren't getting paid for acting, the, their, the joy took over. And it merged everything together. Uh, and so I love that. That's what I like about these so-called outtakes, because they're, those are like I was saying to Esther, that's just a symbol. We can have some fun with this. We really can have fun. You're not even able to show up at those cases anymore. 
You can do it over the telephone or whatever, but still, just the memory of the time you being there and being playful. And for some of you who don't know, of course, that Stephen's been a lawyer, so this was his movie tonight. Yeah. <laughs> he was like reveling in the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I, I, I just did, exactly, I just had a conference, status conference, I had to go on the record sitting here in my office. So I'm reporting into the court, and the commissioner knows, knows me, and she goes, Mr. Wiggs, how are you doing? And I said, good afternoon, Your Honor, fat, dumb, and happy, as usual. <laughs> so that's true. It's like, oh, I can take it serious. How can I help you out? But it's, um, yeah, it's just, even when it wants to be serious, I, I, I got to step back and see that and see that temptation, that temptation to, to remember not to laugh and, and, not, and to get caught up. But thank you. It's, it's fun. Uh, thank you. Hmm. Okay, I see Jeffrey there has his hand up. So go ahead and unmute yourself, Jeffrey. There you go. Hello, can you hear me, David? Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, thank you. <clears throat> it was, uh, I went on to look to vote today and I saw the fear of full transparency and <clears throat> the other one and I was like, huh, oh, I want you to be. And I end up not voting. And then uh, later on I, I tuned in and I'm glad I did because I just wanted to share uh, what happened with me recently with this. And uh, I love that you stopped it at the scene where he went into the, into the bathroom because uh, before the, before the guidance retreat, Susanna and I, uh, Frank was, was with us for that. And on the Monday he was, he was leaving to go back to LA and to Switzerland. So he had been here for four months with the COVID and so we had a shift and Suzanne and I, before the guidance retreat had a prayer, we said, all right, let's, let's see what our next step is for us and for the relationship. She hasn't been supremely happy here in Reno and I've had quite a lot of function and, and everything. So, so we had the prayer out and we went into the retreat and you guys had those amazing sessions and I was journaling and loving it. And, and so I heard something pretty clearly on Friday night with, you know, with Susanna and us taking a time apart and whether she went to Mexico or, uh, or Holland because Holland had been in the mind and, so then she wakes up in the morning and I wake up in the morning and they really came clear in my morning meditations and stuff. And she wakes up and she had a, she had a dream of like being in Mexico and France is playing the guitar. And so rather than share my, <laughs> what I, like, you know, the ego snuck in she's like, Oh, she's going to figure it out for herself. But she's going to like, I'd rather it come for her or whatever. Cause I'm afraid of being the betrayer. If I say, I think you should go that she's going to interpret it some way. And so all that was there. And, so oh, I could wait till tomorrow after the retreat. Let's really make sure that this is what I feel. <laughs> and so after the, the afternoon session, we went out to eat, Frank and Susanna and I. And I came back and I laid into bed and I got violently sick. Now, I haven't been <laughs> sick in a long time. I literally know, of course, Frank was like, oh, it must have been the shrimp. And it was, uh, you know, <laughs> it must have been food poisoning and in form like the I was throwing up and everything it would look like I was like no man I was holding back and I, <laughs> and it's very rare that I go to bed holding something so I shared a lot of it that night with Susanna hey this is what I was hearing I wasn't able to get into the deeper stuff that night it kind of happened in the morning but yeah it literally went away you know instantly as a result of yeah facing that fear of and for that it was you know it showed up at first of the fear of yeah, being the betrayer, I don't want to be with her, or whatever it was. And and then I got deeper into it. It's actually, you know, once I, I got to settle into it, it was really, I mean, there is a deep fear of following the guidance is really what it is. And it shows up that I have this choice for specialists. And then as we kind of both joined in it and she felt it and we started to move, I noticed my mind started to shift towards people in the community. You know, there was this, my mind wanted to go towards ones that I had connections with there. And still I, I could see that, whoa, there's like this, there's just a deep fear of, of following the guidance and whatever the direction is right now. And so it was cool to watch this movie. <laughs> Mine wasn't as, as funny and laugh at laughter as Jim Carrey. It was more, more throwing up and, you know, but it was just so, 
yeah, it was so obvious that it was like in that moment. And actually the last time I got sick was, was when I came back from Cincinnati, I went and visited Dale and I had heard in meditation that I wasn't supposed to go to Brazil with you and Francis. And I was like terrified to even make that statement to you. And I got sick then, you know, and then I sent the email, like, I don't think I'm supposed to go. And you're like, great. Yeah. You got your function there. And then of course it never happened anyway, because of the COVID, but there's such a fear that I've shared on one of the other retreats, a fear of, yeah, betraying or the same feeling I had when I went to community and left my parents and brother back East. And, you know, at the time, a bunch of people that I was working with and so it seems to show up in different ways still. So this was uh, this was a great movie for me to to really bring it back to mind and see that it can be more with laughter than than uh, actual sickness. So thank you for pausing it at those spots. It really, uh, it really <laughs> oh, that's beautiful, Jeffrey. It's beautiful witness too because yeah, this it's interesting this uh, belief in betrayal how deeply it runs and how that's what the practice really is you know you you hear a guidance you're like yep yeah, okay yep yeah, yep yeah. and then and then it comes through so crystal clear and then how the ego tries to turn it into something devious you know you get a thing i'm not supposed to go to brazil and then the ego comes in to try to make it into devious or you know we're supposed to take some time apart the ego is always trying to put a spin. It's like a spin doctor of, of turn it around. But in the end, it's like that that beautiful, here we show this scene in the bathroom and it's like you just get a big smile on your face because there it is comically acted out in the most <laughs> amazing way just for the spirit to make it clear. Like, uh, like Lori was saying, the, my yes be yes, my no be no. It's like, Give it to me straight. Make it simple. Make it direct. Make it clear. And that's the prayer of the heart. Then when it does come, we're ready when the ego tries to do its spin doctor <laughs> thing on, on the guidance. But that's, that's getting down to the real core of things there. Because you, you know, for a lot of times people say, well, wait a minute. No, I want to hear the Holy Spirit. And it's like, well, there's the ego's in there trying to sabotage that. And and yet, it feels so good. It feels so, so good when, when you can see it and see it clearly and acknowledge it. So, thank you. That was all for us. The, the bathroom scene. <laughs> thank you, Jim Carrey. Tom Shadiak, you know, there it is again. I was saying, you know, he, he made a, these movies and they're so good and they're so helpful. He directed this, mu this movie and then it changed his life, you know. He's he's transformed, and same with uh, Jim Carrey. Wow, he's gone way beyond acting in movies. You know, he just let himself be done through in the most glorious way, and now he's taken it to heart. You know, in more and more in his life, where he's like Richard Deer Gere did. You know, going beyond the roles to what what was this all for? What was it showing me? So fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Warm fuzzies. <laughs> oh. Okay, I see Mary has her hand up. Go ahead, Mary. Oh, hi. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, first of all, I just want to... Um, I, I just kind of want to make a comment to Jeffrey that I love that authenticity of his because it's so helpful to you know to have someone spill their guts um that's and um share in that authentic way and it, it's kind of like it gets me off the hook of having some of these you know get making myself sick and doing these things and and also being able to laugh about it so that's mm -hmm. that was beautiful um but but we're on this subject I, there's a uh something that that struck me tonight and I, it was kind of a uh something I wanted to pass by you but you were talking about um not taking things personally and then it, I think it, it, uh maybe shortly after that you said um something about not taking it seriously and I'm I'm thinking maybe um they kind of mean the same thing maybe um yeah that 
because, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what it means to not take something personally. Um, but I know what it means to not take something seriously. So anyway, that just kind of came up for me, but also, um, um, uh, you know, last week, I think we saw the game and you compared it, um, to the man who knew too much. And as I was watching, I noticed in myself that watching the game, uh, man, I didn't have the same feeling and energy uh, that I have like this movie. It's like, I was just like, oh, this is too, this is too serious. This is too, um, it was too much for me. But there were so many people that just loved it. And I was like, what's wrong with me? I, I, you know, I, I didn't love it. I just, it, it was kind of um, draining. And so I'm seeing in myself a preference for comedy. And it's, and then, but then when you compared the game to the man who knew too much, it's like, well, all I need to do is see the game with a sound, with a laugh track. <laughs> you know, it's like, maybe I forgot to laugh. Maybe I'm the one taking it seriously. So, and, and what it also comes up, you know, that lovely quote of seriousness causes reincarnation. So I'm kind of in this place where I'm, I'm really wanting to um, get lighter about all this. It's like, this does, this is not, this is not have to be serious. You know, even, you know, you're talking, you talking about you and Lisa laughing about, oh my gosh, I think I would have been crying, but, but then laughing about getting locked out of the car and you're trying to get to the airport and we're, you know, those things are, seem so darn serious, but you know, are they really? It's like, this is really coming up for me tonight. You know, and even Esther finding this uh, safety deposit box almost empty. Is that not really just laughable? I mean, are we supposed to just laugh our way through this? It's just so ridiculous that it's <laughs> like, why are we taking any of this seriously? Yeah. So I just had to make that comment. But I did yeah. like this. I do love these comedies. I think I like, I just am ready to laugh because I'm tired of serious. I actually think I need a laugh track to watch this world. It's like this world is so ridiculously ridiculous. It can't be real. It's it's just getting so crazy. But, you know, yeah, it's really, is it is my mind doing this? It's like, what? You know, this is crazy. So I just need to develop a laugh track in my head all the time. <laughs> That's great. Oh, Mary, you're onto it. I think the person, taking it personally and seriously, they are the same. And, uh, you know, it seems like we're getting, we're just laughing more and more, but I think that's a great idea of having a laugh track uh, to, to put to the whole world. Like a soundtrack, except this is a laugh track. And it's interesting because uh, last night I was, I was thinking about, oh yeah, our, we've got our... Uh, August uh, theme is coming up, Beyond the Body. And uh, I was talking with Helena Elias, and, and Helena, you were, she was saying, well, I don't know, it's, that's, I, I, I want to sign up for it, but I'm thinking, whoa, that's, that's, that's really, <laughs> that's, going, that's going a long way. Like, I don't, do, I, do I really want to sign up for that? Yeah, I think I do. But, and then I, I was telling her, I said, yeah, I, I thought, Wow, that's going to be that's such a cool idea because that's going beyond the personal and beyond the seriousness. We don't even know what that means, really. We have to just say, okay, beyond the body, we're going to let it let it be shown. Let us be shown what that is. You know, that's our prayer. And so I was uh, up looking at the hard drive of movies, and I have this thing where it's got all these uh, movies with my commentary. So I'm sitting there. Oh, look at this. And then I started getting into quantum movies, and I thought, that's what I need to do in the end of this month. I just am going to watch a bunch of quantum movies with my commentary, and <laughs> maybe I'll be gone by the <laughs> beyond the body, <laughs> the, the retreat. But the thing about that's the joy of the laugh track, you know, of just not taking it seriously, because it seems like that's, that's the only strain we ever get into, is when we actually look at the world and, and think that we have to somehow make, make something of it or interpret it in some way, other than laughing at it. You know, and, and just, we were all laughing here, 
Well, you were talking about the laugh track, you know, we, we were feeling the, the joy of that. So we're, the, we're right there with you. We're totally right there with you. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh. Okay, well, I don't see any hands up at the moment. I don't know if anyone wants to wave their hand or... Oh, I see Mitha <laughs> just waved her hand. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> That's easier Mita. than finding here. Um, it's been very interesting following the theme from the time we started watching these movies with you, David, and plus the weekends that come in. And um, where I was at the time when it started was pretty stuck. And um, there's a phrase, there's a word that you have, I have heard in every single one of them as you've gone through that has resonated for me, and it's the word relax. And then there'll be other things that go with it. So tonight it's like, relax. It's not serious. It's all, uh, it's all after. It's all to not be taken seriously. But that, that theme of relax, and it has a, like, with all of the experiences created from the movies and from your talking about the movies, I have just gotten lighter and lighter and lighter as we've gone forward each week with this. So, um, and for some reason that word relax, just coming from your meaning of it and how you're doing it just takes me there. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mitha. That's beautiful. That's Music to our hearts, going from stuck to relax. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Let it happen. <laughs> That's it. Beautiful. Okay, I, that might be it. Oh, I see Esther has her hand up again. Go ahead, Esther. I just wanted to share that the music from Suava, the new album, just takes you to a place just beyond this world. I mean, it prepares me for that beyond the body, uh, just like I was thinking about her and how she was listening to the music on shuffle and what it did for her. And I just think of that moment with her, her sharing about that when I listen to it. I just want to thank Suava so much for listening to Spirit and just going through whatever she went through to make this happen. It's just fantastic album. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Esther. Yeah, she's been sharing. Is Ding, when your uh, messages come in, she goes, Oh, Esther! Uh, and ding, and there's another one from us. Uh, we know, we can tell your exuberance. <laughs> and we were talking, you know, we, who knows, the movies, there's so many great movies, we have so much fun with it, but then even with our online retreats, you know, we may end up, after On the Body, that might be uh, Beyond the Body, we might end up doing like, I don't know what they'll turn into after that, they could turn into... <laughs> like satsangs or, or music meditations or, you know, I think, I think we're just getting higher and higher to the point where we're, you know, we're answering all the questions and it's very joyful and gleeful. And then, yeah, we're just going to keep evolving into, into the, the joy and the happiness. So thank you for sharing that about the music. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's, it's officially the release date is Friday, but... Esther was like, when can I get, when can I get, when, 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 <laughs> so you're like the, you're the poster child for the pre-order. <laughs> she says, forget pre-order, I got it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. From all of us down here in Mexico, and wherever you are all over the world, we're with you, you're with us, and we love you, and we so enjoy seeing your faces and hearing your expressions, and I'm glad you enjoy this as much as I do, because <laughs> I, just, I just love feeling the joy and the love pour through and, and experience it with you, so we're, we're so connected. 
in this. And we'll see you next Wednesday. The, the joke here is it's always Wednesday. <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're losing track of time and then it's like, it's Wednesday! Like, su <laughs> surprise, surprise! <laughs> what happened to, nobody's asking what happened to the week. <laughs> they just see your smiling faces and of course it's Wednesday. <laughs> it's our own uh, Groundhog Day, but it's Wednesday, it's always Wednesday. <laughs> So thank you. God bless you.